Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast. Here's your host, Pete Tigers. I'm always trying to make sure I'm in touch with what is happening in fly fishing, and we all worry that younger people are not picking up a fly rod. My guest today is in his 20s and lives and breathes fly fishing. I'm looking forward to see how our pastime looks through younger eyes. It is my pleasure to introduce Adam Price Hunt along, who is a great fly angler, awesome tyre and all-round good guy. Adam, it's great to catch up. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good, thank you, Pete. Um, missing the fishing with the uh, the weather and the um, the water levels currently, but I've been sat at a tying desk most nights, um, dead excited to get filling dry fly boxes back up again after the season. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks, Pete. That's great to hear. And it's that time of year where we're all sort of reflective and we look back on the the season as it's unfolded. How how do you look at your season? How does it feel on reflection comparable to other ones? How's it been for you? So in terms of fishing, I've certainly done a lot less fishing due to personal reasons. Um, however, the sessions I have been on because of that have been really memorable ones. Um, I've been to Bosnia to fish over there with friends. Um, I took my partner fishing for the, the first time. Um, and we've been to some really memorable places and caught some memorable fish. So um, I'd still class myself a, a lucky season, really. Wonderful. And we were talking off mic, and you, it, it sounds as though you've managed to get out this week as well. Yeah, so I went for a two-day trip with my friend Tom Lee up in Wales. Uh, he lives in Kersus on the the banks of the River Severn. Um, so we tried to find some fishable water up there uh, and ended up in the typical running around in cars, looking over bridges, trying to find something that's actually fishable, uh, which we did manage to find some fishable water, but typical to Upper Wales. We found the perfect water, the perfect clarity, and thought, this is perfect, and couldn't find any grayling. So, yeah, we went home pretty sore after that one. Yeah, and it sounds to me as though you did the perfect plan that you tried to head as high up the system as you possibly could. Yeah, yeah. when you're driving through the valleys up there, they're, they're so steep that any amount of rain just comes straight into that river, um, brings the river straight up. Uh, and without insulting the farming community, a lot of the farms there and how they're farmed just allows for soil runoff to just colour the water up straight away. Um, so that's quite a big issue when there's any rain, really. Um, as well as obviously you've got the, the dams that release, um, and you'll you, you'll see the the tips in the in the gauges as they release. So it, it's all a, a bit of a minefield, really, to try and catch the perfect conditions for fishing up there. But I think that's part of the fun that you never know if you're going to quite get it just right. Yeah, it reminds me actually. I was fishing i've got this little thing going for end of season now and funnily enough seeing the end of the salmon season in wales and i was out with um paul richardson and the year previous to that was a similar story and i'd been washed off the tamer i drove all the way up to wales had a couple of hours with him and then we stayed overnight and the plan was to fish hard the next day and i think the river came up about five feet Um, very very quickly and it's almost you're sort of driving along aren't you with your fingers crossed as you pull over to look down in the river were you you doing a similar sort of thing yeah there is nothing more soul destroying than looking over that ridge and just seeing brown (laughs) and you always tell yourself even though you know it's unfishable you'll always look at your fishing partner and go maybe two squirmies maybe (laughs) And the amount of times, I'll be honest, I've been with Chris as well, because he's ever the optimist like me, Chris Flay. And we'll actually wade her up, get in the river, the first pool, throw squirmies in that normally goes like this. Yeah. <laughs> and then decide, um, yeah, this isn't the best idea. <laughs> I normally end up fishing elsewhere. So, yeah, it's all about having been said, some of the trips where we've turned up to uh, flooded rivers, and ended up having to do plan B, C, E to try and find somewhere. It actually ended up being some of the best fishing sessions around. I know me and Chris ended up on, I think, River 5 in a grailing season last year. Um, ended up with about an hour and a half fishing left of the day. 
Uh, I think both of us caught PB Gladiators for that season in that year and a half. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a real scramble, but um, I, I kind of enjoy it. You know, I live in the West Midlands, so around by me, there's just no trout and grayling streams around us. I think the nearest one's probably about 30 mile. So driving is, is just it's what I have to do. Although I will call myself quite lucky because being in the Midlands, within a two-hour drive, I'm in Derbyshire, I'm in Wales, or I'm on the chalk streams. So it is nice that I have that variety to sort of go around the country, really. Um, yeah, so I do like those sessions and I do like driving out there on just total explorations and seeing what comes of it. Yeah, it's nothing like hunch trips and, yeah, as I said, that look over the bridge and saying, well, we could give it a go, we could give it a go. And sometimes you often know that it's not even worth it, but at least you put your waders on and giving it a good whack. So you said where you're based in the um, Midlands there, does that mean, and you're, you know, you're, you're, able to travel for everything Does, is there any way that you would consider your home water so this may sound strange but my home water is two two hours away about 85 miles in Derbyshire uh, on the Peacock Fly Fishers Club um, it's it's a club I joined through Andy Buckley actually I had a guided day with him and he sort of said to me look at the Peacock mate you, you'll like that and with the dry fly only, and just, just the way the land is and the, the, the rivers, um, after fishing it once, I just fell in love with the place. And since then, it's the fishing community within the club is so strong. You make friends really quickly, and, and before you know it, you, you're in a, a little family. So that two-hour pilgrimage on a morning, uh, although it sounds quite long, it, it, it just... It just flies by and I always tell myself when I'm driving two hours, is this worth it? And I always think, if I lived in Australia, two hours is to the local shop. <laughs> so relatively, two hours is nothing really. Absolutely. And as you mentioned that water, it is um, absolutely fantastic. I love the way the club is run, particularly from a beat point of view as well in that you can't reserve anything, you just sort of rock up. And I, I think it works nicely in the sense that because you're not allowed to wade, you're not going to disturb water too much. Of course, a heavy cast or whatever whatever that may be could frighten things away. But generally, it doesn't matter too much if you are following somebody up the river as long as there's a reasonable sort of gap. But you can always just go and head somewhere else as well, can't you? Yeah, that's it. And the, the dry fly rule on the why, um, I think in terms of actually club and fishing management, you know, make no mistake, every club really around the peak times of Mayfly is pressured. And having the dry fly only rule as well, we, we've seen fish taking, you know, Mayfly dry flies in the season and you'll hear one angler catches it and then maybe a week later another angler does. So you know that fish is seeing pressure, but it's nice that, that fish then will actually sort of sit down and it can happily nymph away and still feed without the threat of being caught again and again. So it, it, it's really nice how it manages itself, really. And it becomes a really personal river because there's, there's so many technical seams and bends and, and low-hanging branches where, where certain fish will just sit there year after year. Um, and it's nice that no matter what level of angler, that you'll always find a fish that will always test your abilities on the Y. That sounds wonderful. And it's uh, we'll, we'll speak some more on this in a sec, but obviously I was up and saw you in the summer when we were up at um, Mallon and Green. And of course I went to the bridge there in the centre of Bakewell and saw those le leviathans that live by the bridge. They're extraordinary fish, aren't they? Yeah, the town pets, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a bit of a taboo place to fish for the anglers in the club, <laughs> for obvious reasons. But I think it's a powerful asset, really, that when we do have anglers go through the town, um, it allows every tourist in that town, and they always do, they stop you. What are you doing? How are you catching that fish? What, what What's this method? And I think as much as anglers, we don't like to be around people when we're out, that interaction that can sow so many seeds for you know people going... I'll try that. I'll have a go at that. So I think it's a good asset to have, really, in the club. 
And you said about a dry fly only rule that the club has. I assume up there it's either a chip fly or a bread fly. <laughs> Those guys yeah, yeah. Going. A really bleached LK Caddis yeah. in the bedside court. <laughs> <four. laughs> <laughs> they, I, it's the only place I've seen the ducks actually more frightened of the fish when you throw something over there because, of course, I have to go and do that and to see these amazing fish and some wonderful grayling as well there, aren't there? Yeah, there's some there's some really big grayling and it, it becomes um, quite a skill in itself, actually, to sort of when you're walking up because obviously the town separates two beats. So if you're walking through, it's always a bit of a, a bow and arrow cast just to try and wait for trout to move away from one of these grayling and just see if you can pick them off. Um, especially the condition of the grayling through town. Although, you know, it's not, you know, technically the most pure fishing. It's nice to just get these grayling out of the water sometimes and just look at them. Especially in the wild, the old grayling tend to have this really sort of dark tungsten look to them. And they really are, you know, fish you really want to get out and have a look at. Absolutely. So you're spending time at the club. It's dry fly. Does that make you, um, as an angler, think a lot about what is hatching? What a lot about? And I know I, after I saw you guys, that I went and fished the uh, day ticket water at Crestbrook and Lytton. I was pleasantly surprised how testing the fishing was from getting the fly patterns exactly right. Do you find that? Has that sort of fast-forwarded your knowledge of, of entomology? Oh, it's totally, totally. On the River Wye, despite what people think and the amount of fish in there, you could quite easily go out there, get it wrong, and catch nothing. Quite easily. And there's so many little niche environments where you'll have uh, an area that's got more riffles, an area that's got more depth and silt. And so those fly hatches, not only from day to day to area to where we're at, from section of the river will change. And being able to see fish and work out what they're taking um, is, is a real skill that I've developed on, on the peacock waters, really. And I think, what well, I mean, whether it's true or not, people of scientific background won't be able to tell me, but it's almost like because the fish know how much food is in that river, they can afford to just be so selective and sometimes even just a slight size difference of fly will be the difference between catching that day or not. So it really is, I think out of all the UK rivers I've fished, I think if you can master the Derbyshire Y, you, you'll do quite well anywhere in the world really for trout on the dry fly. Nice. And does that mean then when you're fishing and you see a fish rise, talk us through your process then, because it's very, very easy, isn't it, that we've got a day off and we're going fishing and we see a fish rise and you fire out a cast. But t tell me what would happen for yourself if you spot somebody, s s spot a trout rise. So I, I naturally would have a habit to just fly in there that I have to sort of hold back this little fishing demon. So I've almost developed... Uh, like a rule of three so if I see a fish rise and I think it's a fish I want to target I'll just sit there and let it rise three times I think even the distance between those rises tells you a lot you know if you're going to sit down pour a coffee and by the time you've even put the lid back on the flask the fish has rose three times it tells you that you know you want to get in there quick it's, it's, it's a fish you're probably going to catch um, from there I'll get in a pool I think a lot of emphasis put on nowadays and I think it comes to the tackle manufacturing side is about distance casting distance lines distance rods and I think actually there's there's an art to wading and if you can sneak up and just shuffle your feet in between the boulders and just sneak through you can get really close to fish that are feeding if you take your time and that takes out so many variables um, and when I'm in position I'll stick with the rule of three again so if I put three casts over that fish and it doesn't take, I'll sit there and I'll let it rise another two or three times. Because often that those three casts, I almost like to think of the dialogue of a trout. I put three casts over it where a fly hit the water. And I'm imagining that trout suddenly going, you know, what, 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 what's going on? This isn't, this isn't normal. And I think if you stop and just let it, let that trout think, oh, oh, it's nothing and carry on you'll have an extended period where you can keep targeting that fish. And I've been on fish when the hatches are strong. And I've sat on fish rising hours and hours 
and they've been comfortable rising around me. So yeah, that's the way I like to target fish and it's probably the way I like to fly fish the most really, just stalking out those fish. Um, I find if I nymph, you know, for the winter for grayling, if I nymph, I'm sort of, I'm out of the blocks of the car park, it's non-stop all day. I prefer just walking up a river, finding a fish, sitting down and going, I'm either catching that today or I'm going home. That's the way I like to go. <laughs> I like the sound of that very much as well. That's my preferred method of fishing. Some great tips. I love that rule of three as well, and I'm, I'm sure listeners will think about that a little bit. You, you talked about grayling, and you talked about the pace, and I was thinking about it when you said it, that do you think that we fish grayling in a different way because it feels as though those days are shorter so that you're trying to fish that little bit harder do you think there's an element of that to it as well totally totally i think when those days are shorter and especially when you say if you book a beat on the wireless passport and it's a three mile beat in your head you think i've got three miles i've got to cover today so off you go and you, you, you sort of fly up a pool 100 miles an hour when actually I've started to realise now that walk the beat and once you find a pool that has the habitat that grayling love, they will be there and you're far better off sitting there really dissecting that pool to find that fish. Um, it does depend on river as well. So in Wales where there's low stock, I will cover pools a little quicker because I find that if the fish is there and feeding, you've got a pretty good chance of, of, of catching it. Um, so if you don't get a take in the first couple of runs, I'll, I'll move poles or move on. Um, where, you know, rivers like the Dee up in Wales that has huge populations of grayling, you know, I'll maybe take time dissecting a pool and, and, and really getting through the fish stocks of that pool. But yeah, I, I find the winter sessions are far more tiring when I get back to the car. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot colder as well, especially when oh, yeah. you've got a hole in your waders, which I've hopefully fixed at the moment. So tell tell me, Adam, that you're on a river and you're grayling fishing, and that was, again, some great advice about walking the beat, which, you know, years back in books, they used to say that. And I'm thinking, God, I don't really do that. I don't know if that's experience that allows you to do it, if you know the water that is well. Yeah. Um, it makes perfect sense, I guess, if you don't. But what are you looking for then as you're walking the river What for, from a grayling point of view? What are, you, what are you searching out? So I'm always looking for gravel. Gravel's a big one for me. Um you know, if you can find a, a nice a nice graveled area, grayling, they're going to prefer to sit there. Uh, from there, I, I'm looking at a reasonable depth, you know, anything sort of waist height. Although I know grayling can be much shallower and that can be at the head of the pools in next to no water. If it's a winter session and I'm targeting, you know, I want to go out and catch a few fish, I want to target ideally the most suitable water where I think most of the grayling are going to be. So I'm almost looking for that waist deep water. Um, not necessarily a seam. For some reason when I'm trout fishing, I'm always looking for seams and pockets where grayling. A nice steady pace all over, really. Um, they'll, they'll happily sit, sit and feed in. Um, so I'm looking for that water. Pace-wise, like you say, I'll, although I know that can be right up in the fast stuff or that can be you know far down the slack stuff, I'm always looking for an area in a pool that, that's almost just at a gentle stroll pace. If I'm strolling down the bank and that water's the same pace as me, I'll stop and I'll look at it and think, right, is this water I want to target? And, you know, over the years, I've sort of found that if I'm working up a pool, you will have days where there's hard hatches and they're right at the top or they're right in the tail out. But I've found that those, those bigger fish and those better days I've had, they're in that water in the middle that's just at gentle strolling pace. So, yeah, that's the water I like to target most. That's some great advice again. And, you know, I think about steelheading books I've read. There's some some big clues that you've given there to listeners. And even from a steelhead point of view, that's the water you're generally looking to, to fish as well. But And there is fun. I love heads of pools as well because you do get that whack, don't you, from a fish if somebody's sitting in there. That's really, really exciting. And from a fly perspective, so let's say you found your walking pace pool. It's waist deep um fly are you are you thinking right i want to get it right down on the deck straight away so does that affect what you're actually going to be tying on and the weight of that fly and and size of fly as well because i've seen this trend 
a, over uh, quite a few years now, smaller but heavier. Is 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 that how you like to go as well with with your flies for grayling? Um, so not necessarily smaller and heavier. I personally like to go as light a fly as possible. It's sort of an evolution over the last few years where um, I used to, you know, I want those nymphs on the bottom bouncing along, you know, and maybe in the depths of winter when it's really cold, that's where I want the flies. But actually over the years, I've realised that as long as you get that dead free drift and you can have flies that go through that water, you know, albeit a foot off the bottom, two foot off the bottom, and they're going naturally, that nine times out of ten, those grayling, they will move in a mount for flies, you know. And I think as anglers, we when we're fishing dry fly, we're looking at our line on the surface, we see drag, we see drag doing this on the top of the water. What we don't realise is, there's drag doing this underneath the water. And if you've got five mil of tungsten that's doing this through that water, it's not natural. It's not natural. And going to Bosnia especially, clear water, over there that's heavily pressured fish and you see some of the world's best anglers out there and you see that those those world-class anglers are able to read as as the ranunculus beds move the water they're able to read that fly not only going across at the right pace but they'll add little lifts in that move it just at the right time and it, it, it's deadly how effective that getting a fly down there but that can move up and down naturally because of a low weight. It can make a huge difference to a cat rate. It really can. That's wonderful to hear. And I rem- it, rem- it, it reminds me of a time we'd been Toby, uh, my friend Toby and I, Toby Merrigan, had been washed off. I can't remember if we were washed off or it just wasn't very fishing very well, the uh, Earthhorn. And we yeah. decided to go back down to one of the streams down here. I remember it because he caught a great big grayling. And I also remember we were. I was fishing a pot that was deep, and I saw this grayling come right out of nowhere, right up through the water column to eat that fly. And that's a fascinating um, idea that you've come up with from there. Does that also mean, though, if you're you're nymphing, whatever we want to call it, tight line nymphing, does that mean lighter nymphs are slightly more challenging from a casting perspective? And I use the term casting loosely, of course. Definitely, it's definitely more difficult when you're using lighter flies. Um, however, I think it's sort of it's a comfort zone to use heavy flies because you, you you're automatically in contact with those flies, you know. And I think we need to get away from that really. And if you can read a piece of water nicely, and even if you cast, and you get the indicator off the water, and you're relatively tight, if you come through at that pace. Even if there's a slight bow in the indicator, if a fish takes, it'll straighten. Or there'll be some indication. I think just being able to read that water and, 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 and be comfortable with light flies. Go out for a day and just take light flies and, and make it work. And you'll be surprised, actually, that those flies sort of, you know, in my box over here, Pete, I might as well get it out it's while it's sat here. I've got rows, of, I've got 5.5 millimetre beads down here. They've never seen the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what do you mean, yeah. Adam, by weight of flies and light flies? What do you mean? Do you mean two mil or do you mean almost unweighted and wrapped with lead or or whatever that may be? What are you, what are so you saying? So I've been experimenting this, this year with that using, um, you know, a, a, a 3.5 millimetre, say, point fly. And then on the dropper, just, just playing with unweighted flies or, or lightly weighted flies. Um especially when you can get a point fly that'll get other flies down, why do you need the weight on the other flies? You know, you, you want your fly at any point to be acting as naturally as possible. And I almost see now that that point fly can be sacrificial in order to make the dropper or the two droppers fish more effectively. Um, and I've certainly noticed in the last year or so of doing that, my catch rate, especially on those first and second droppers, has definitely increased. And that these are, like you say, there is a comfort, it's easy to cast, and 
a comfort in those setups and it is having the confidence and hopefully this chat of people are listening will give people the confidence to give that a go and i i like that very much so uh, i like your thinking and it, it brings me nicely on to talk about yourself how would you describe yourself as an angler um how would i describe myself as an angler i'm, I'm definitely the slower paced angler I like to be. I like to consider myself in sort of the the hunter stalker category. You know, I'm 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 walking the bank to find a fish that I want to go for, and uh, I spent a lot of time actually on the the Derwent on the Peacock Fly Fishers Water this year. Um, it's it, it's quietly snuck up on people the fish populations in the Derwent. Some of the wild fish in there are astronomical in condition and size, and. They almost develop personalities. They live in parts of the river. Some of those fish you, you won't see throughout the year until a particular hatch or a particular fall, and that's your chance to catch them. And after it being my home water for so long, I, I can almost, on that two-hour drive up, I can drive up and go, right, so today it's going to be warm. The older beetles are going to fall. This is the fish I'm going for. I remember it from last year. And those are the ones I'm going for. And some of those fish, you've got such a short window to catch them in of a week or two. So it, it, it keeps that excitement flowing through every session that there's always, this is a turn for this fish, this is a turn for that one. Um, and I really like that aspect of fly fishing and, and having a club at the Peacock with anglers with that mind too and with the powers of WhatsApp and social media. There's a few, there's a few of us that will, you know, video a rising trout and go, has anyone caught this one yet? Has anyone... Has anyone seen this fish out in the water yet? No, no, we haven't. And it becomes that sort of challenge to who can who can trick that fish. Um, and I have to admit, that, that sort of mindset, it, it, it gets me in risky places sometimes, Pete. I'm, I'm well known for a, for a sort of kamikaze wading, should we call it. <laughs> and a few times where you know, a big fish has rose in a pool and other guys have gone, oh, you can't wade to that. And I'm sort of going, right, even the little chest back that's high up, that's coming off, right? Wait. <laughs> and uh, when you're trying to throw a full line with just the wrist movement, it becomes quite quite a difficult task to do. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I like that. Um, you were talking about, you know, the, well, they'll be on orders today or they'll be this. Does that mean you keep a diary of some sort that you can refer to? Or does um, WhatsApp become your diary? I wouldn't say WhatsApp, Pete. I spent a lot of time um, camping out, spending long days by the river, full days during different times of year. I mean, for instance, a few guys this year in March in the Brecon Beacons, we camped out for a few days trying to catch the March Browns. And I remember me and Steve Shorrock, we opened his tent box on the morning read the thermometer and I think it was minus 12 on the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a cold one. Um, but the difference between spending a day on the river and being able to even just do one overnighter and getting to see the mood of a river and learning the personality and the times to fish is, is such a massive difference. Um, I always try and have a, a week period during the Mayfly on the Peacock where I go up in Derbyshire and I'll stay there. And I'll fish the mayfly for that week. And by the end of it, most of the day, I'll be honest, Pete, I've got a beer and I'm on a, a bed chair and I'm sat there either fast asleep or waiting. Because I'll know. I'll know when the time is. It'll be cloud cover come over. Or it'll be a time in the evening. And I'll go, no, now's the time to get out there. And I appreciate that, you know, because of modern life, not everyone has the time to do that. But just being on the river at the right time can just make fishing so much easier. It really can. Yeah, that's some great advice. As an angler, would you say you're superstitious? Um, the only reason I ask that is that I talk a lot about my superstition of a cap. And listeners won't be able to see behind you, but there's about 20,000 caps. Um, that makes me wonder if perhaps you are, would you be superstitious or not when it comes to fishing? Um not superstitious in the caps. It's almost just become a, a fashion item sort of thing as I as I pan around and show you the wall of caps. <laughs> it's almost become a, 
a bit of a fashionable thing just just to keep collecting cats really but i do have some superstitions in fishing and amongst sort of my friendship group that go fishing if if we get in the first pool and someone catches on the first cast that's a bad day that's yeah. a bad day <laughs> Yep. We know full well that me had the amount of times we've been out and gone, it's happening today, and that's been the only fish of the day. <laughs> so that's a bit of a superstition, really. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in you sort of, you, you get your own look when it comes to, uh, to fly fishing. If you, if you spend the time and you dedicate yourself, you know, whether it be onto one fish or learning better casting that you, you take the look element out of it really yeah yeah you're ab- absolutely right and um, i was thinking of the former guide in me if you catch a fish first cast of the day that's a dream and i'm not counting <laughs> after that so that's i will be uh, honest pete I, I, I do guide up on the peacock as well and that notion as a guide to just get that first fish off the shoulders is <laughs> yeah. huge and uh, as much as I love guiding on the, the Derbyshire Y. When you've got a client who wants to fish, you know, 12 p.m. till like four and a half day, and it's 33 degrees and bright sunshine, <laughs> yeah. that that is terrifying, you know, especially, you know, if that angler goes, I'd like to spend the day on the Lathkill, please. That puts a fear of God into any guide who guides up in Derbyshire. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yes, I fished that with Andy, I think, when I was up there. That was, now I know I feel qualified to speak, that was extraordinary. And I think that was some of the spookiest fish I've ever fished for. Um, And somebody said, what, like New Zealand? And I said, I think it might be even trickier. They were so difficult. I I almost think that the fish population, the Lathkill, it's got such a dense population for a small stream that it's, it's harder to fish because of it. If you target a fish on the far side, and it's only two rod lengths wide, you're going to line about four trout in that cast because you don't have a choice. And as soon as you spook one pool, the amount of times I've been and I've spooked one of the bottom pools and I've just looked in my head, that's the next quarter of a mile of river done for. Because <laughs> yeah. they go up and up and off they go and it just causes havoc really. So... But there is good management systems on the wide for the peacock. It's it's the only on the on the Lathkill, sorry. Um it's the only river where we do sort of have a booking system where we just it's so casual, we just let Jan know, look, I want to down the Lathkill. Um because it's really not the river you want to follow an angler up on. It really isn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Andy and I would take it in turns and he very graciously, I think, let me have a crack. And this fish came up, had a look, had a cup of tea read a bit of a newspaper, perhaps did some of the the crossword and then came up and ate it. And I'm just the whole time thinking, don't stuff this, don't stuff this. And thankfully the fish stuck and he came up and ate it and I sat and he was on. But that was challenging. It was wonderful and I loved every single second of it. It was just wonderful fishing. But um, tell me, um, Adam, how did you get into fly fishing there? Because your depth of knowledge, um, you know, your your skill set, um, where did that come from? How did you find fly fishing or how did fly fishing find you? So to take it back, really, I, I have to talk about how I got into fishing. And I really have to thank my, my granddad for that. Um, my dad despises the sport. Can't stand it. <laughs> uh, my granddad, he's, he's a match fisher, course angler. But, um, and I'm going to upset a few course anglers now, I call it, he, he course fishes properly. You know, he, he'll go out and he'll, he'll stick float a river for roach um, down this way. And, and, and growing up, it was always learn how to fish a stick float properly. And some of those skills, like reading seams as you're drifting a float down, it transfers straight over to fly fishing, being able to read flow where the fish going to be. Um, and it was actually on a day course fishing with my granddad on the river team I walked downstream and I watched a fly angler casting a fly and where I was struggling on on float tactics this angler was just catching small trout grailing dace all on the dry fly and I looked and thought yeah that's a bit of me I've always been that that really intuitive angler so my granddad would sit me on a seat box and he'd go right see here for six hours before long I'd wandered off into a peg further down the river or 
you know, I, 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 it was on a lake. I'd, I'd found a carp feeding shallow, and I was after that. And uh, I quickly knew that sitting there for six hours wasn't wasn't my idea of fishing. I liked the, the exploration side of it. And um, really from then, I just bought some really basic fly gear, um, didn't have any tuition or guiding at the time, and I really went in through a baptism of fire. I thought, I want to learn this sort of the hard way. And that might sound strange, but I really like learning things the hard way. So um, I bought a small stream passport on the Winos Foundation, which gives you so many small streams that run through farmland. And we'd either get the train up there before I drove and we'd just walk across fields, knock on farmers' doors. Or um, I'd drive there after I got my car. And I'd just fish these tiny little streams. And for new anglers getting into fishing, I really would recommend small streams because you can experiment so much. Because if you get in one pool and you totally mess it up, there's another pool above it within 10 yards and it's refreshed, start again. And you can experiment so many different things on a, a mile beat of river. And it also helps my casting too. So at the time I bought a six foot two weight to fish those. And I've been to a few still waters just to learn the overhead cast and get myself into it and thought, you know, I've, I've got something. The fly's going out. Um, and fishing those small streams, you come to a pool with low trees and I sort of stand there and go, right, I've got to do something there. I've got, and, and you know, just experiment, just, just almost relearning the whole fly casting thing from like a caveman discovering fire. It really was sort of that sort of methodology and being able to just throw under trees and move rods and still throw a decent line. It's, it's been a skill that really has been invaluable to me moving on to other rivers. So I'm really glad. I learned how to fly fish that way, really. It's a really uh, interesting story that you talk about there. And I was going to ask as somebody younger, and we've talked on previous podcasts about, you know, having somebody next to you helping, because that's the big difference, isn't it, from course fishing to fly fishing, the casting, um, because it, it sounds as though the, the river craft um, was instilled already. And then it's making those casts. And as as somebody younger as well, you know, I was fascinated to learn whether you learned casting from watching YouTube videos or if you had someone. But learning a little bit more about you as a person as well, it seems to me as though you have to figure it out. Was that a long process then to get the casting to where you felt you were happy with it, but also that you were detecting, yes, I'm picking up a few more fish as a result of it yeah so it was probably a longer process than if i had tuition but i'd say really going out every weekend within about three or four weekends i, I had a, a fishable cast and after that it was just about you know those situations where there's a low tree or the bank's tight on the right or you've got to come off your left shoulder and i almost just think about it mechanically learning i'm thinking well in a cast, I'm moving my shoulder, my elbow, and my wrist. So I'd almost throw a cast and think that wasn't right. So I'll do something different with my wrist this time. That's a little better. So it's, that, that was in the wrist. Or I'd just think about the actual movement and break it down. Um, the way I did that was just through experimenting. I know some anglers would do it through reading books or, or through guided session. And that's, there's no better method over, over another. That's just the way I learned to do it. And like you say, a, a small a small stream is a great way to actually do that. And it means that you don't have to throw a great long cast as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, perfectly manageable. So that makes perfect sense. Uh, I suspect I know the answer to my next question about um, tying flies, because my guess is that you probably started doing that relatively quickly because you wanted to catch fish on flies you tied yourself. Would I be right in that? Yeah, totally. So I very quickly um, got into fly tying, um, starting off with the really basic stuff, um, borrowed from people, just to get myself into it, really. And very quickly, it's almost... By buying flies, you can only buy what's on offer. 
if you go to uh, to an online retailer, you know, you can buy a, a tungsten bead in this size, a gold bead in this size. Um, and as a whole, sometimes it, you just want a fly pattern that's just tweaked. I want a dry fly with a little less wing, or I want a slightly slimmer bodied um, nymph. And being able to tie just opens so many doors for that. To the point where, um, even now, I'll be fishing sections of river once, and then in my head I'll think, I'm going to go back and tie a fly just for this pool. You know, um, and I'll experiment. Um, I did it this year on the peacock, Derwent. There's an angler during the mayfly hatch I was guiding, and he said, I want to learn how to year a nymph. And as, as, as every dry fly angler, that killed me inside. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but actually, I'd never done it. I'd never euro nymphs during a heavy hatch. And so I tied up some size 10 hare's ears with a gold bead on the front in about 3 mil, really light patterns, and basically fished it like a mayfly through the water. And it was an absolute red letter day for the guy. He lost a fish that was, you know, I don't know how to guess waste, but like a, a 3 or 4 pounds at the net, you know. And... Every cast, he was just getting hammered by, by really heavily feeding fish, and I thought, I've just, I've just, if it wasn't for me experimenting at the voice, I wouldn't have these occasions on the river. So it really does open that world up. Nice, and congratulations! I saw that you've joined Semperfly as well. You must be excited about that. Yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, Semperfly's. It, it's a really great company. Uh, I've used their their time silk. I have to admit. I have a bit of a temper sometimes and don't have much patience and time with thread, especially right whip, whip finish time, whip finish time, snap. The amount of time. <laughs> so to use like threads like nano silk, which just doesn't break and, and some of their products and I love how they're, they're really trying to innovate the fly tying material market. Uh, it, it just aligns perfectly with, with, with my, my sort of outlook on fly tone really so yeah it's a great partnership to have fantastic and i bumped into you at the um Malin and green event that we have you you hang around there from time to time too so Malin and green is it's a place i hold so dear to my heart with marie and john honestly uh, i started off as a customer uh, and that didn't last too long <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then i started tying in there and it was a day when marie was in who's got all the management knowledge and she's she's one of the best hosts you know and, and people i've ever known she's amazing um but she's not a fly fisher herself and i was just tying flies quietly down the bottom it was quite a quiet day and a guy comes in and uh, i think he was on a, a bone fishing trip soon to cuba and he just said i need everything i need everything i need and i looked up and saw marie and it was a deer in a headlight situation because <laughs> john wasn't in and I sort of like, it was a calling, Pete. I stood up and thought, right, this is my time to shine. <laughs> and walked around the shop with this guy. And it happened a few more times where I'd just start fishing chats with people that would walk in. And I'd just be like, right, so, yeah, you need this or try this, try this. And in the end, Marie would be like, oh, thanks, thanks for doing that. And doing what? She's like, mm, you know, you've made a sale. Have I? I was just talking fishing. <laughs> So, yeah, and I have to thank the parking warden in Bakewell because the amount of times that I've been well over on that car park, st stuck in the shop chatting or doing something, and I've not got a ticket yet. So I'm really quite lucky in that aspect. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. It is such a wonderful storm. We had such a great time. And like you say, the culture and the camaraderie of fishermen uh, in the area and that being a great hub for them to me i thought was absolutely fabulous and we'll be back up there again early next year and i've been talking to marie about that and we've got some plans to do some more stuff up there as well because it's really important to me these communities and connecting and 
joining communities together as well. So we'll be doing some more of that. But as I said in the introduction, as somebody um, in their 20s, um, I think that qualifies you, despite all the experience and everything that you've done, as a younger fly angler. And, and I certainly don't mean that from an experience standpoint, as you've clearly proven. But how does fly fishing look to you right now? Um, is it in good shape? And um, do you think it it, it it feels good to you right now? So against most opinions, really, which is, is the sort of common opinions doom and gloom, but I'm actually quite optimistic, Pete. I really think we're, we're at the bottom there of an upward spike. And I do actually put that mostly down to social media. Um, and more importantly, TikTok and Instagram Reels, these short snippets of videos and I'll sit there on TikTok scrolling through and I, I'll go through videos. One will be a wood turning video and then a, a ballet video and then a golf video. And actually being able to see just tiny snippets into a hobby is it, perfect for fly fishing. Because nowadays you can't really say to someone, give me six hours of your time and I'll, I'll, I'll take you and do something you might enjoy, you might not. And being able to just see, especially with the increase in you know videography skills, drones, uh, body worn cameras, GoPros, and stuff like that. The footage that you know anglers and, and people out there can get now is insane. And being able to see that fly fishing has almost become cool. I don't think quite yet over here. I think it's in the states. You see a lot of people my age with poor moustaches and mullets with baseball caps on. <laughs> And it's getting that hipster hobby. That's what it is. It, it, it's getting there. And that will that will come over to the UK. Um, I've got a young cousin, uh, Daniel, and he's just... Um, he lives, he's lived in uh, Switzerland, Denmark, so we've never really been too close. But um, he started getting into fishing through that way, through his friends, through looking at social media. And it's awesome to see that people totally outside the hobby can actually be brought into it that way. So I think we're in a, we're in a good place. I think we're in a good place. I like what you're saying there, and uh, I'm with you in the US. It's always been, um, you know, I think it's, it's played a part, certainly in my development as a fly angler, and I've had friends on here who are guides in Montana, and like you say, they, they say the plaid shirt and the baseball cap, that look, um, and that comes over. And you touch, possibly when this one comes out, I'll be out in Denmark again for my yearly trip, my Rem Ray to catch sea trout, which I absolutely love. And that is a vibrant scene there. And it's wonderful to hear um, you talking about that and how that may bring people in. Does that, and you touched on it in the um, very beginning, are you still worried though about the environmental background for fit? for fishing and the, the the rivers and you talked about runoff from fields and stuff like that. Does that worry you? It does, Pete. And um, I'm sort of in the environmental sector for work anyway. I'm sort of into tree inspection and tree work anyway. Um, and I've done a lot of that on rivers as well. I used to volunteer for years um, for the Birmingham Anglers Association doing, you know, branch clearance, river clearance and vegetation management. And even in my short lifetime, I've seen fish stocks plummet, really. Um, and rivers that I once knew to hold huge amounts of fish or, or good fish just, just don't hold them anymore. And I think um, us anglers don't always want to accept it. We'll go out and think, oh, this season's been tough. This season's been tough. The one before it was tough. And I think that we almost need to realise after a while that it's tough because the stocks aren't there. And we need to start thinking about how we can change this. But luckily, I think I think that's in motion now. And I think finally, um, with anglers, canoeists, wall swimmers, we're all starting to group up now. And I think there's power in that. And I think there's power in 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 over time that will change. Um, I know a lot of the farming practices are changing, and there's a lot of people doing work there. You know. A lot of the times in, in, in farming, it's frustrating because I've been out to farms and a lot of the time, their justification for doing things is, well, that's why my dad did it, that's why my grandfather did it. And I think now that as farmers are going to agricultural school instead of just staying on the farm, that they're learning new ways of doing things. And I think over time, we are starting to realise how much the environment 
you know, how much we are damaging it and how much we need to improve that. So I think the, sh- the shoots are there. We, you know, we're not flaring yet, but the shoots are there. And do you think the younger people like yourself are more aware of that and will be, uh, like you say, the groups joining together a little bit? Do you think you will be more vocal and using the media that we've, we've talked about to push those stories even more strongly? Totally, Pete, totally. Um, I think my generation, you know, we're, d- there's a lot of strong-willed people. It's very, you know, we're a hostile bunch. We're here to rock the boat. <laughs> and uh, I think once we sort of get into a subject, like I have with fly fishing and, and fishing in general, you know, I want I want to improve it. I want to make a difference, you know. Straight away from the offset, Pete, I'd fish, stop rivers and stop places and thought, this isn't for me, you know. Give me a little wild, wild trout anywhere. And I've always been that mindset that if I go to a wild fishing river and there's not many trout in it, you know, I never think, oh, they should stop this. I think they should improve the habitat here. We need more trees here. Stop grazing right up to the river, you know. That's just been my mindset. And it's it's one of the main reasons I joined the Peacock is because Jan and the team that work at the Peacock have the same the same ethos. It's about promoting that wild habitat and the fish come afterwards. Yeah, I think that's beautifully put and eloquently put as well. So thank you for that. Keep fighting the fight. Don't be suppressed. Don't be quiet. And, you know, yeah, we've just got to keep pushing and keep pushing. So let's move on to, uh, as I said, being in the store there at Mallon and Green, you get to pick up some nice gear. And do you have, what do you like to fish with? What's your your favourite? Have you got a Hall of Fame rod that you like to fish with? Ah, uh, so... Does, I wouldn't say there's one single rod, really, that's my Hall of Fame. Good. I don't know whether that. Yeah. yeah, I don't know whether that'll come <laughs> with age or you know. Um, I've used some beautiful rods. I must admit, uh, when the the staff at Mallon Green used to work for Orvis and we did the Ogden's Day Festival at the Peacock, they lent me the um, the Pen Creek bamboo rod that Orvis yeah. do. And it's it's the first time I've used a bamboo rod and thought this this is I can see why. I can see why people use these, you know. But being honest, I think the reason why I haven't gone down that route with rods is when I'm fishing in small streams or places like in Wales where I'm jumping over barbed wire fence and then poking it through, you know, hawthorn trees, I'm thinking if I have a nice bamboo rod, it's going to be dead in a week. It, <laughs> it just would be, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's um, at the moment I'm using a lot of Douglas rods and they're relatively new over here. And they're real nice rods to use. I'm using the 11 foot 3 DXF for nymphing. And I think nymph rods will go that way, you know. I think we, we've gone as as light as really we need to go with nymph rods. I think now we'll start to see uh, an increase in length. We'll see 11 foot, 11 and a half, 12 foot even. I think that'll start to come into it, especially with the European nymphing market. You know, um because I can see the advantage of it, really. And uh, for dry fly, most of my work's with a nine foot four. I used to use really short rods and small streams. And then I've actually come to the realisation of the longest rod you can get away with is the best rod for fishing most situations. Not always the most fun. I have to admit, when you're throwing a six foot two around, you don't have to worry about trees so much. You know, when you can roll cast three feet off the surface. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's nice, but yeah, I'm starting to realise that the the extra length in most situations does help. <laughs> nice, excellent. Um, I use my bamboos exactly the way that you fear, and you have nothing <laughs> to fear. So I hope, Luke, you're not listening. Um, but yes, I do all of the those sorts of things with them. I use them. They're supposed to have a higher tensile strength than steel or something. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid. And if you get the chance again, go down that route. It's just fantastic fun. I've been using graphite rods again and really enjoying that. But a couple of things have happened the last few days that got me thinking about getting the bamboo rods back out again. <laughs> I fished them for 90% of the season. It was just the back end that I didn't. Um, yeah, yeah. But I'll be getting those back out again and fishing with those again. But um, you've talked about Bosnia. You've talked about where you're based and the places that you like to fish. 
Where is a dream destination for you, though? Where is that place that you think about that you may have seen on some of the uh, social media channels that you talk about that you think, wow, that must be amazing? So I'll, I'll be like, like any angler, really. I see videos from New Zealand come out, some of the places in America, and, you know, I'm in awe of that. But almost my dream destination is that place that's not got social media coverage yet. You know, the exploration side of it's big for me and I'd rather, I'd, I'd probably say New Zealand would suit me better. The idea of bushwhacking through uh, through backcountry for two hours to find one fish in a, in, a, in a run and, you know, catch it or go home grumpy. So <laughs> that, that definitely, yeah, that, that definitely. And I, I do prefer clear water. Where I can find it, I do prefer clear water. I think being able to see fish and see how they interact with flies is it, it, it's such a really visual and such a stimulating thing to be able to do. So I think if people haven't been out and, and been able to fish a clear water venue, they really should. It does open your eyes to so much. And those rivers that you fish around Bakewell, obviously uh, you can see the behaviour of the fish. And you, you touched very early on about chalk streams as well. Does that mean that you've been a visitor down to those and that's helped with your want to, to spot the behaviour of fish. Yeah, so um, I haven't delved too much into the chalk stream world at the moment, and it's something I do want to change. Um, I have fished a few times at the um, the Wilshire Avon section on the Manningford beach, and that is it's sort of a perfect mix, really, for for clear water and small stream, and it's such a technical bit of river to fish. It really is real spooky trout, small flies. It's right up my street, really. So. Yeah, I, I do like that idea of chalk stream, but um, especially sort of the wild stocked areas is definitely definitely something I really want to explore more. So that is on the bucket list to do. Uh, well, best of luck with that. We'll talk off Mike about some of that stuff as well. So, um, and we've done this um, playlist on Spotify. I think it's called the Fly Culture um, Road Trip List. I always now ask a guest to give a song. Um, do you want to give me a song that sets the soundtrack um, for a day on the river? So I'll go with a recent one, actually. There's uh, a new artist called Noah Kahan who's just released an album called Stick Season, which is like American country acoustic guitar music. And it's, it's, it's all about changing autumn into winter, really, in that mood. And it's, it's a sort of album you listen to, but you don't listen to the words. You just play it. And I don't listen to music when I'm fishing, but it's probably the first album I think, you know what, I, I could put that on, you know. Or when I'm, leave, when I'm leaving home and I've got, you know, M5, Junction 1, Old Breed, Rowley, Birmingham, and then I drop into Wales and I see the hills, I'm going to press play. That, that's what I'm listening to on the way in the last hour. <laughs> nice i'm gonna have a listen to that that sounds brilliant and i'll have a listen to that and i will add that to the list as well so thank you for that um you've spoken all i can wish is that when i was 27 i was as eloquent mature spoke with such such knowledge and passion about something that means so much to you um I think we're lucky that you're in fly fishing. I think that's wonderful. Um, what does it mean to you, fly fishing? Um, I'll be honest, it, it, it means life, you know. Uh, I've spoke off Mike and I hope to do a piece for Fly Culture magazine, actually, to talk about the year I've had. And it's it's been a real rocky road mentally and to the point where I wasn't even able to get out fishing, Pete, you know. The thought of going out the house and, and physically exerting myself was, was too much. But the people in that community, even when I was bed bound for a while with illness, you know, I'd sit on FaceTime here, fly time with Stephen Shorrock and Chris and Tim Wood and a few others. You know, when I needed something to look forward to, Steve popped up and went, right, you're on the plane to Bosnia. You're off, you know. Um, when I wanted to get out the house some more, but I, I, I couldn't quite fish yet. Maria said, right, come sit in the shop. And we just, we just, you know, we had teas and coffee. And I will say, I, I, I rolled up and she hadn't seen me for a few months. And 
I'd lost about two and a half stone at this point. And Marie, she's my adopted mum. And the moment she saw me, she went, right, we're all in a Derbyshire oat cake. Then we're having fish and chips. And that's all we did for the day, Pete. We sat there and just ate crap. <laughs> Brilliant. And actually, yeah, to, to have that, it is culture. To have that culture and community that through hard times is, it's, it's always either the, the actual fishing itself I've turned through as a therapy or the community around it is, is it's phenomenal really. And I'll go as far as to say, Pete, I wouldn't be here without this community. I really wouldn't. It's kept me sane and, and on the straight and narrow. So I owe it a lot. I owe it a lot. That's beautiful. And um, like you say, uh, your story is going to appear in fly culture at some stage and it's, um, yeah, you'll get the chance to read that if you read the magazine. I, I can only recommend, you know, I know the story and um, how fly fishing has helped has been wonderful. And there'll be lots of people and myself included that fly fishing has been so much to them. And it, it really does mean a lot to us all, doesn't it? And we're, we're lucky we've got it, aren't we? If I may add, Pete, it's fly fishing itself. I mean, I think a dry fly fishing, stalking a big fish, it's it's a mirror of life. Some days you sit there waiting for a hatch and it won't happen and you can go home pissed off and upset and sad or you can just think, next time I go, it might be different, you know. And you might have four or five bad times where it doesn't happen or it doesn't work out your way. Just wait and be patient and you'll have that one time where It'll come good and it'll work and that hatch that you can't control will, will happen and you'll realise that it was all worth it. And I think that's a perfect mirror to life really that a lot of people nowadays lack that patience. Just just give it time and wait. It'll be okay. That's beautiful. I think that's we've I think that's a beautiful way to tie up this um podcast. There's so much in this, Adam. There's advice on many levels that I think um, people will enjoy listening to. So um, before we go, um, how can people find you? I suggest um, people search Adam out, look for him and look at his social media output. How can people find you, Adam? So, yeah, most of my social media, uh, Instagram is APH underscore fishing, uh, same on my YouTube and Facebook is Adam Price Hunt. Uh, for any guiding and anything like that, either contact Malin and Green or the pod, the uh, Peacock Fly Fishers Club. Um, but I really like communicating with the community. Anyone, any level, just drop me a message. Just drop me a message for any help you want and, and we'll get chatting. That's beautiful. Adam, it's been wonderful chatting with you. I'm so thrilled that you're part of our fly fishing community. Thank you, um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you for being a wonderful guest. Thank you for the invite, Pete. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, that is another episode of the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as me. Uh, as ever, these are always free to download. There'll never be any charge. There'll never be any adverts. Um, it's important, I think, to be able to talk about fly fishing and what it does for us, what it means to us on many different levels as we've explored today. So thank you for listening to this episode. And as ever, there'll be plenty more down the line before too long. Thanks for listening. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly published magazine owned and run by fly anglers. When it comes to fly fishing, we've got you covered. Mm-hmm.